my name's Evan. Uh, I'm the events manager for um, Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and a mainstay of the San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. Um, thanks for being here tonight uh, as we launch um, uh, Paul Madonna's new illustrated novel, Come to Light. Uh, you already know all you need to know about me. I'm the events manager at Booksmith. Um, I frequently do other things. Um, Paul Madonna, though, is an award-winning artist and writer whose unique blend of drawing and storytelling has been heralded as an all-new art form. He's the creator of the series All Over Coffee, which ran in the San Francisco Chronicle for 12 years, and the author of five books, including Everything is Its Own Reward, a winner of the 2011 NCBA for Best Book, and the Emmett Hopper Mystery Series. Paul's work ranges from novels to cartoons to large-scale public murals and can be found internationally in prints as well as in galleries and museums, including the Oakland Museum of California and the William Blake Association in France. Paul is the founding editor for the Rumpus.net has taught drawing at the University of San Francisco and frequently lectures on creative practice. He holds a BFA uh, from Carnegie Mellon University and was the first ever art intern at Mad Magazine. Um, also an inspiration of mine, Paul. Um, so nice to be here with you tonight. Um, thanks uh, for being here and congratulations on the book. Thank you, Evan. Nice to see you again. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who showed up tonight because man, October, October is a hard month even when uh, we're not in lockdown. I know of at least two other events tonight that I have friends in or, or people are doing. So, you know, I know that uh, everybody's attention is being constantly pulled. So thank you for being here. I also want to say thank you to Booksmith, who is a fantastic bookstore and has been for the entire time I've known them. They have a the great program of doing signed copies with local authors. So, yeah, I'm happy to go up there and sign any books you guys want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I figured um, I would start off just by um, asking um uh about um your shift from uh, your shift to illustrated novels um all over coffee obviously you um uh, made pen and ink drawings of cityscapes um with uh, kind of short um, pieces of fiction um but the last three books of yours have also included um uh, a longer narratives and i'm wondering um how uh how you came to that evolution yeah thanks you know what's interesting is for me there it's it's very much a clean evolution it's it's it, the novels are sort of all over coffee times a thousand because uh with the strip i was doing and early on i would do a couple images and then one little conversation or piece of flash fiction but you know by the end or at least the last 10 years of it it was one drawing and one story and, uh, and after a while i felt like that was just that was one beat that I was doing and I wanted to, to have them evolve. And there was always this relationship between the image and the text that was sort of abstract and we never, it was about the space in between the two of them. But for me, it was also the, you know, what is the story of the image? What is, and not just the, oh, here's this house or this corner and what's going on there, but what is the atmospheric story? And so by telling longer form, it was a way to say, okay, I'm going to make a whole body of drawings. So maybe that's, you know, a hundred drawings of one style or, or five bodies of 20 drawings in different styles. And then what is the story that's going on with all of those? And then to be able to tell this sort of deep narrative that I could take the reader uh, along that journey of the images. Awesome. And um, how has, how has that um, changed the, the process for you? Um, I, I'm so um, interested in your, in your creative process just generally, and I imagine it's changed a little bit um, with that evolution. Well, yeah, that's, it has changed the process a lot. And that's, that's been great for me because, you know, after 12 years of publishing weekly, that, that routine and that schedule starts to get you into these creative habits. And, uh, and I found for myself that I, I was repeating my habits. You know, I would, uh, I'd, especially like if we talk about the drawing specifically, I would be out scouting and, and a lot of scouting for me is about light and shadow and not just the, the location, but I would find myself, you know, driving down the street or walking and I'd see a corner and it would be in, in this beautiful light and I'd stop and be like, oh, I need to take a reference photo for that because I want to draw that. And then I'd stop and look at it and realize while I hadn't drawn that corner, I'd essentially made that drawing before. You know, it was like the same type of structure that I was was drawn to and this the same hour of light. And, uh, and I would even find myself standing in the same sort of relative position. And I realized that I needed to, to shake things up. In order to see differently, I needed to approach it differently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, especially, especially for the first novel, I made a lot of drawings in the beginning that I threw out 
because it was through the process of having to look at the world differently and and discover what the character really was was thinking like what character was i writing and why was i showing these drawings and uh and and that's how i was able to make a shift to making you know they're not totally different drawings but they have a slightly different point of view mm-hmm. and um uh, and it it was a way to take myself on a different journey and sort of keep my eyes open Wonderful. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the, um, the reference photographs. I was going to uh, ask, there's a point in the, in the first book of Come to Light where Emmett uh, mentions something, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, I don't know how the uh, plain air painters used to do it before they had reference uh, photos. They, they must have had fantastic memories. I'm wondering um, if you have um, kind of a trick like that for, for writing? Um, uh, do, you, do you imagine the scene and then write it? Do you make it up as you go? Um, how, how does that work? Oh, is that's it- an interesting shift like from, from talking about drawings to, to talking about writing. Uh, you know, for the first book, I was really obsessive with, if I had this, an idea, I had to write it down, I had to get it in my notebook. And I was that way with All Over Coffee. Like anybody who knew me during those years, we could be in the middle of dinner and somebody would say something and I would just grab my notebook and write it down. It might not have anything to do with what they said, but it sparked an idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this book was really different in, um, there's something that Hemingway said, he talked about like, you know, he would, he would uh, stop writing at 12 o'clock noon, even if he was in the middle of a sentence. And he said, always, always walk away from the typewriter when you still have something to say. And, uh, and you know, I, we can all extract our, our meanings from that, but what I took from it is that by practicing that, if it was, if it was good, I wasn't going to forget it. And if anything, I was going to come back to writing the next morning and, uh, and I would have fleshed it out in more in my mind without even knowing it. Uh, but you know, the, the great thing about doing long form is that you, you live in a story for two to three years and you get to know it and you get to know it in a way of, that it's almost like something that happened in your own life. And, and while memory is distorted, of course, there's, there's almost more of a clarity that comes from living with that story because you get to know the details and you go over them over and over again. And so a lot of times with this book, while I wrote a lot, I didn't, I didn't write unless I really had worked it out in my mind. Mm-hmm. And so that allowed my active imagination to be ignited all the time. And, and it's, it's still that way. You know, I've already started into books that's, you know, you finish a book, it's six months before it comes out at the very shortest. So, uh, you know, what I find myself daydreaming about is the new story. And, and, and that daydreaming is like reviewing a memory, but it just gets a little clearer each time. Mm, wonderful. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, that um, you needed to kind of look at, at the work from um, a different perspective or to approach the work from a different perspective. And I, I, it, I wanted to ask you what it's like um, so the, the character Emmett um, is, uh, is an artist and um, uh, is, is taking on this detective work. And of, of course, uh, his, his drawings are um, uh, um, uh, staggered throughout the, the book in ways that illustrate the, the, the narrative. And so I'm wondering um, what it's like to, um, to embody, to, to make drawings or paintings as your character. Um, is, that, is that different? Um, how is that different for you? Yeah, what, what's great about it is that, especially with this book, so in order to answer that, I want to talk about illustrated novels for a second. Um, the, what I wanted to do differently with this whole series was uh, if I was going to have drawings, I, just like Oliver Coffey, I didn't want those drawings to be, if the, let's say the scene was, you know, there's two lovers in Paris uh, having a meal in front of the Eiffel Tower at sunset. And you turn the page and there's a drawing of a table with, you know, glasses of champagne, the Eiffel Tower and the sunset in the background. To me, there's a, that's redundant. And, and the, the reader doesn't need to see it because the, the words have already given that, that image to them. But, but what, what can the drawings do that the text cannot? And so that was the, the, the question I wanted to answer for myself going into the book and that's into all of these books. And that's why making the protagonist an artist, we could watch him drawing along the way. So while he's having these experiences and running down the, you know, solving this mystery, he's actually drawing and in his, in his in-between times. So we're seeing the drawings he makes. And given what's going on, sometimes he's, he's more stressed out, sometimes he's not. And in the really erratic times, his drawings start to break down. Yeah. And so I thought of my, 
to answer your question, I thought of myself as stepping into that character. I imagined as if I, I were an actor and I were shooting a film out of order. You know, and they said, okay, it's time to shoot, shoot scene 43 now. And I had to, had to look at the script and say, well, emotionally, where's my character at? And be able to hit that beat so that when they, when they put the whole film together, it showed a, a, an arc of the emotional experience. And so there were places that I would go and I'd say, okay, well, Emmett is here. He's in, you know, the south of France and his drawings, he's having a rough time. So his drawings need to be really loose uh, and they're, they need to be breaking down a bit because that's where he's at. And so it was really a fun thing to do to say, that's what I need to do today. I need to draw like this today, not just make a drawing of where I'm at. And, uh, and there were also places that I went like a year later to, to revisit because the drawings I had made initially didn't necessarily have that the right resonance. So I went back with that saying, okay, this is where the character is. Yeah, and so and so, um, did you uh, you travel to specific places that you had in mind already um, uh, for for um, for kind of the scenes of the book? How how because the the book uh, you know the uh, Emmett travels travels around quite a bit. Um, uh, were, were these just places that you, that you wanted to go, or places that you found well, yourself? Or how did there are definitely did places I, I wanted to go. I mean, you know, who sets a book in a place they they don't want to visit? Really, <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean. <laughs> um, but you know, I set the last book in Asia, which is uh, I had been wanting to do a project there for for like ten years before I'd got a chance to be able to return and do it. Uh, and then, so I wanted to set this book in Europe. And even though the, it picks up at the end of the previous one, he's in Asia. But uh, you don't have to have read the previous book to read that one, this one, and that was really important to me as well. But um, I, I wasn't sure exact the exact locations. I knew I wanted to do Rome because there was a historical reference of, uh, from this series of paintings called the, the Flooding of Piazza Navona. And that was uh, a reference that I wanted to use that ties into the narrative. So I knew, I knew the second volume he would end up in Rome, but otherwise the rest of it, I wasn't sure. Uh, and in planning the book, I, had, I was also uh, I was offered a retrospective in the south of France. So that show was being put together and I was being taken there for the summer and being put up and I was like, well, great. I'm going to be in France, so I might as well make some work. So it was a great way to, to sort of tie in the opportunities I had and, and what I wouldn't necessarily have chosen to, gone, to go to those villages specifically, mm -hmm. but only because I, 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 didn't know, I didn't know them. So they, it was a way for me to learn a new place, meet new people, and make that work and tie it into the book. Now, it also ends in Amsterdam, and that was really intentional because along the way, Emmett is reading uh, this 1970s Dutch crime writer and he's referencing him throughout the book. And so he keeps saying, I wanna go, I wanna end up in Amsterdam. So I, I really just had those two places and I re let the rest figure themselves out. Very cool. Um, so you mentioned that, that you had a show um, uh, in, in France there um, and that was part of the, uh, the reason. Um, in, in the book, Emmett, Emmett also has a, a show um, uh, there if i'm not mistaken um that's uh um well no actually he's invited to do the venice biennale it's in, in venice right and so that's kind of the the whole premise is that he begins with he's he's making a new body of work that's going to be shown in the biennale in like a, a year and a half from then so uh but then this whole series of events happens that that sends his life into chaos so he's he's simultaneously trying to use the the work for the exhibition to to have some sort of consistency and baseline. Like that's his stability in his life. He's saying, he's like, I'm gonna work for this exhibition, but yet everything else is going crazy, falling apart all around him. And then eventually, you know, the work starts to fall apart too. Well, I was, what, I, um, what I'm wondering is, uh, um, what, is, there a, is there a relationship, I know, um, b between you and Emmett, it, it is where I wanna go because, because um, you know, I know for like Oliver Coffee, um, a lot of the, um, the text was um, overheard snippets, as you, as you mentioned, um, whether they were actually overheard or, or imagined overheard um, in some cases, I think. Um, uh, but but um, yeah, I know Emmett, Emmett uh, has a backstory of being a rock star and, um, uh, um, and, and becomes an artist. And I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if there's a parallel there, if you were in a band um, that, I, that I should know about. And, and <laughs> <laughs> or shouldn't know about, right? <laughs> uh, no, and you know, that's the interesting thing about making a character that is also an artist, the, the sort of danger that'll be perceived as 
a, a thinly veil, veiled self-portrait. And, uh, you know, I have to say with the first book, I was, I was overly concerned with that. And I, I did these things with him that I was trying to make him so it would be obvious. I don't know, obvious to whom, so, you know, trying to be at least obvious to myself, like, no, that's not me at all. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is, I think some of those choices weren't, weren't great choices because they, they weren't who, they didn't come off as, uh, as realistic as they could have. Mm -hmm. And so I solved a lot of those this time, but also because I gave up worrying about it. He's, he's not me. I'm not trying to portray myself through him. But in a way, he's sort of an alter ego, right? Because I have to be able to step into his character and I have to be able to understand him. And then I could give him at least a lot of my own creative, you know, like when he talks about drawing, it's, it's me talking about drawing in a lot of ways. But, uh, but you know, and, and I don't know who it was, but an author once said, he's like, I, I love creating characters because my job is to run them up a tree and throw stones at them. And it's like, you know, you do things to your characters, you put them in crazy situations and, and uh, that, you know, you never hope to be in. But there's also the, the giving him responses, the way he might react to something really becomes him. That's, that's the real character. So it's like, I could almost, I project myself and then allow it to, to take on a new, mm -hmm. a new persona. Uh, the, the him used to being a rock star, <laughs> that was really, I love this idea of somebody's famous and then they, you never hear of them again. Like, and, and there's, we all have that. It's like, whatever happened to that band? What are those people doing? You're like, are they stocking his shelves in the grocery store? Are they like running some aluminum factory now? Like, and people go off and they do all this interesting stuff, whether it be within the creative field or, or anything and have successful and happy lives and sometimes not. But, uh, you know, that's where Close Enough for the Angels began, really, with this person who had this big career that everybody knew about and then suddenly was gone. And that was fast, what was fascinating about him to write about for that first book was, who is that guy? What kind of life does he have afterwards? And, um, and he has a really interesting life, and he also has a really interesting relationship with uh, fame or celebrity, because I think after you go through something and whether you're spit out the other side or you willingly exit the other side, you no longer have the same uh, desires or your desires take on a different form. And so that's something that's really, I really love playing with him is, you know, giving him to work with is uh, that his relationship to how the world might perceive him. And he also, he has a brother who is a twin brother who is a, an actor. So he's often mistaken for his twin brother, which has another le level of that because he, sometimes he's like, sure, I'm my brother because then he gets to be, it's sort of a freedom. There's like an anonymity in that celebrity. For sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about character development and, um, and how, how, you, how you do that. Um, uh, since it's it's something uh, so compared to Oliver Coffee, you know you you weren't really doing that um, at that time. Um, uh, how how do you do it? Um, do you do you map uh, folks out? Um, you're kind of just daydreaming the whole scenario. How do you how do you bring the people to life? And how do you um, how do you uh, evolve al along with them? Yeah, it's a good question. The mapping is all. I do a lot of plot mapping. That's creating that structure of. What, what happens in the story? Because it's one of the reasons I love writing mysteries is because they, um, they, they have to be like clockwork. They're, they're a mechanism. And, um, and what, the, what you set up in the beginning has to reveal itself and it has to tie in in a, in a surprising way. And you, know, there's a, you fall into a lot of cliche traps and you, as a writer, you have to figure that out and get out of those and rewrite them and find, find ways to keep the reader engaged. And, and uh, you know, I, I love details. It's like, I, I see the stories as very similar to my drawings and that I just need, as the more I understand them, the more I know how to draw them, the marks I need to make or the sentences I need to write. So once I have the, the plot sketched out and, and that's the thing that is, you know, I've got a bulletin boards full of note cards that I'm working that stuff out, figuring out character, um, that's the fun of it because it's, how do people react in those situations? And it isn't always throwing stones at them, you know, and um, it's, it's uh, but it is putting them in situations where we get to test their, their character because that's how, I mean, that's how characters made, right? Um, happy times do not really demonstrate who people are. It's always in stressful events or situations. So 
uh, there's really, I, I'll think about it, I'll imagine, okay, well, what's that person going to do and how are they going to react? So uh, I, if anything, that's the real joy of it is, is the development over time. And I, so to go back to Oliver Coffey, again, that was something that I would write these little scenes. And by the way, the overheard conversations, those were always fictionalized. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, it, you know, people often thought they were true, which I just took to credit, you know, to my ability to write them that way. But I would start to write these little vignettes and often I would see so much potential in them. And Emmett Hopper was actually created in Oliver Coffey. I was going to ask. Yeah, really early on, there were, I, I set up these scenes and I wrote a couple of them over the course of a few years that uh, there, there was a, I, I made this young woman writer who would test people at a, at a party and she would say, oh, have you read Emmett's new book? Oh, it's amazing, even though he didn't exist. But she'd do it to see if they would lie and say, oh yeah, I read that, that was amazing. And, um, and so I sort of created this fictional uh, author that I gave to a fictional character. And, and so he was sort of a joke for me to return to. And, uh, and that became fun because then I began to imagine who is that character and what if he was actually real? So, uh, you know, when I look back at my own progression, I can see how I teased various characters out of all those stories that I told. I mean, I, I'm, published over 750 Oliver Coffey strips. You know, there was so many little vignettes that actually turned into larger scenes for, for books later on. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, they're very rich uh, uh, little little passages um, that, that kind of always um, struck me. Um, uh, and, and also just uh, about how um, they always um, uh, invite, maybe in part because they don't have, um, uh, the, the illustrations don't have humans in them um, or, or, or cars in them. It, it, it makes, it, it, it's like an invitation to project yourself into those scenes, right. um, which, which I um, always did. And then kind of like, oh, well, this is, this is a bigger world um, often. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, I'm wondering why, um, why, why three volumes for this, for this book? Oh, that's, that's great. There, there's one, it started off with something really practical, which is uh, Close Enough for the Angels was like 520 pages. It's actually the, like almost exactly the same number of pages as this book, but we, we did it in, in with really heavy paper, beautiful paper, hardbound book, but it, it was just this tome. And, um, and I was I'm super proud of it and I loved it. It's, it's, it's a nice object, but I realized that it's a, it's a hard, you don't throw that book into your bag and take it with you. Not that any of us go anywhere anymore, but back in the days when we went places and we carried books with us, um, and I would be out and I realized the, the way that I would, was reading is like, what did I grab that day? I might be reading three books, but I grabbed the, the one that was easiest to throw into my bag to take with me. And, um, and I was like, that's one of the, the nobody's, nobody's just taking this book out to the park or to a cafe. And, um, and I was like, what am I reading? I'm reading a lot of just paperback detective novels. And so I thought I want to make paperback detective novels, but I want to do it in a, in a unique way. And so that was the very beginning of it. But then there was another part, which was that I wanted to do different type of drawings for this book. And while I wanted to do my pen and ink drawings that, that people know of mine and that they love and that I do enjoy doing, I, again, like I was saying before, I need to see differently. I needed to break it up. And I, I was understanding how I could do more with the new, this new form of illustrated novel where I'm involving the reader in the making of the drawings. And so I decided that I would do different drawings for each volume. So actually I'm gonna do a screen share and, um, and take you through some of that. Great. Can, uh, can you see the image on screen? Yeah, it looks okay, good. Okay, great. So this, this first one is just showing you, so the, on the left, it's the box, and these are the three volumes. Uh, oops, sorry. So uh, these are three different covers, and you can see there's, there's different type of drawing. The, the left is, uh, is pencil. Um, the center is uh, it's, it's ink and, and pen and ink, but color, and also the subject matter is really different. And I'll talk more about the subject matter in a moment. And then the third is, uh, is sort of my more pen and ink style that people are familiar with. Um, this is a drawing that I actually made for Oliver Coffey. It was the very beginning. I hadn't, I hadn't known that it was going to be part of this book yet, but it was one of the drawings 
that set me off on this book because uh, this is uh, Gaudi, uh, the park in Barcelona. And, you know, the way that Gaudi works with nature, uh, the, the, the best, the line I came up with was order chaos. And that really sparked a lot of this story because that's the name of the first volume. And so I used this drawing as the entrance to why, uh, why Emmett would go to Barcelona. Um, again, the, the pencil drawing that I showed you from cover, this is, this is actually uh, in my patron's house in France um, who, you know, who was uh, putting me up for the, the, uh, the retrospective and his dog, but, and, and it really, it, it, the, the dogs are actually part of the story of, of that first volume. Uh, this is a really quick pen drawing uh, from Rome, or actually, excuse me, from Florence. So now here's what I want to talk about with the, the process is this is from Lisbon. And uh, this is where Emmett, you know, he says, I want to, I need to start over again. And, um, and, and so I would go out and just say, I'm just going to take pencil and sketchbook and I'm going to make the fastest drawings I can. And it, it's interesting because I made a lot of drawings that didn't go into this book. And it was because I had to figure out, I had to sort of change the way that I was working, go back to the beginning and remember what it was like to just go out into the field and sketch and, and uh, look at the world, but make different type of marks. Uh, this is from Cinquetera in, in Italy. So this drawing I want to show you, uh, oh, actually, so two sets here. So this is from the south of France. So what I do in the book is, um, I, in the first volume is all the sketches. And in the third volume, are all the finished drawings. Because in the first volume, we're watching Emmett make these drawings. And in the third, he's back in his studio and he's, he's making finished drawings from his, from his sketches. So this is the sketch and this is the finished drawing. Uh, and so I, th I think it's really fun to show the reader because I can't make these finished drawings on site while I'm traveling. So I, it forced me to do a different type of process to get from this drawing to this drawing than I would in San Francisco. And then the, this next set is, uh, I think maybe the, the just the best drawing in the entire book. And uh, this is from Rio Maggiore, which is uh, Cinque Terre in, in Italy. And I included three versions of it here. This is the first sketch I did while being on site. And you talked about taking the people out. What you don't see here are about 8,000 people, tourists. Uh, this is sunset all crowding around, actually kind of annoyed that, that I'm standing there drawing because they're all they're trying to take pictures. Uh, this is the pen work. Now this original drawing is four by five feet. And then here's the ink wash. And uh, it's, you know, it was really fun to know that I would be doing this with, with that sketch. And I did a, a handful of sketches uh, from various places for knowing that I'd be doing a really large, intricate drawing. Um, and you asked me about the volume. So volume two is the, you saw the drawing um, of that, of the cover. And one of the really cool things I wanted to do here is include artwork that wasn't my own because I was drawing a lot of sculptures and I was also the, the I talked about the flooding of Piazza Navona and that series of paintings uh, features in the book as well. So I actually have uh, several of those which are which are royalty free that I was able to use and reproduce. But uh, I, I wanted there to be another artist character in the book uh, who made work and then have Emmett draw those pieces. So uh, I was thinking about it. At first I thought that I would make the pieces, but then I realized they shouldn't be mine at all. And a friend of mine, Diane Hoffman, who is an assemblage artist in San Francisco, who I, I've adored her work for years, um, I know that when she makes her pieces, she likes to begin with a story. She'll often begin with a narrative and then sort of work in character. So I went to her and I said, all right, well, I've got this character and this is, this is how this character works and what their story is. And, and I was sort of fleshing out that story. And I said, can you, I want you to make a body of pieces from this character and then I'm going to draw them. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of these. So this was one of Diane's pieces. And it's, this is just set up in my studio because I'll, I'll show you more in a second. And here's, here's the drawing I made for it. Now, the interesting thing there, talking about how I had to adjust my drawing style, you know, to even 
like doing the sketches, had to loosen up and just say, all right, don't worry about type marks. When I was drawing Diane's pieces, I had to do the opposite. I had to draw the, the tightest that I could because the first couple of drawings I made, they, they weren't working because they, were, they just looked like my drawings of somebody's art. But I really wanted her work to come through. I wanted you to see her sculpture before you saw my drawing of it. And so it was the exact opposite of that sketch where I had to go really tight. I'm gonna go back to that image where you can tell it's, it's not exact, but it's really, it's really close. And I think that the, the mood of her piece, I, I hope that the mood of her piece comes through. And, and here's an example of, I would just, I'd set up her piece, I'd light it in my studio and just be as, as fine as I could with rendering it. And it was really fun, be, especially like to get the textures and to get the colors and, um, and to have to think about making a different type of drawing because the drawing again was not about the drawing, it was about her sculpture, and then it was Emmett drawing her sculpture. And then this, I talked about the flooding of Piazza Navona, and, and you know, read the book, so you can find out more about like the history of that is in the book, and, uh, and it's cool because Emmett goes to Navona, right? And then that, that whole, the place factors into the story. Okay, I'm gonna exit out of there. I was, I was actually going to ask you if the, if the sculptures were by Diane. So, um, so Oh, did you recognize them as hers? I, I, I did actually. Yeah. Um, I'm a fan of hers too. And, and, uh, and, um, uh, is, is kind of the only artist making this kind of work that, that I really, um, know, um, so, uh, or, or follow at least. Um, so, so I, I, you certainly captured, captured it enough to, uh, to, um, for it to come out to me. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And so that was a really long answer, which I know I'm good at, uh, but of, of saying why three volumes, because it started really practical, but then it was also a way for me to say, how can I present three really different type of books? Because the fun of it too is, uh, you know, three covers, uh, the three sets of end pages and what, and so I, I got to design three different books plus a box while making this. So, um, so there was a lot of fun to be able to provide visuals. It wasn't enough work to do one book for one book. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah. Who is it to do one anymore, right? <laughs> then, you know, there's what I love is hopefully one day when we're going somewhere other than our living room and bedrooms, you know, you grab one of these and you can put one of these books in your bag and you can take it with you. And so it was a way that I could do a 520 page book and still make it really portable. Hmm. Um, do, do you have, um, uh, uh, influences for the illustrated novel concept i remember when we were talking about it some 10 years ago and and, and you were starting to have this idea um i'm wondering uh yeah this form this form does um you know it seems like you're pushing the envelope some to me and, and i'm just wondering if there are other if there are reference reference points that you have or um how kind of you've developed the the idea to um integrate the the images in the way that you have well thank you for, for saying that i'm pushing the envelope because that's really what one of the things I'm trying to do in terms of form or genre, uh, because no, I, I, there's, there's no real influences for exactly this style. And maybe that's the point is that I kept looking at all the illustrated books that were contemporary books that were being made. And what I like, some of them worked in different ways. Um, I mean, Myra Kalman, I think does maybe the best job, uh, like principles of uncertainty is uh, one of my favorite books. And, you know, and that was back when I was doing all over coffee and I felt like in a way, you know, she was doing something parallel to what I was doing um, and how we were just creating images and text. But in terms of story and narrative, no, I don't know anyone who's doing it quite this way. And, and it's because the, what I felt wasn't working, like illustrated novels were really made because there was a successful book and then the publisher would hire an illustrator to make some, some drawings so that they, they could then make a color edition and sell it for more money. It, I think it was very rare you know, early, in the early days to launch a book that nobody knew about with illustrations. Mm -hmm. It was only the advent of cheaper printing that allowed, allowed that to flourish. And, I, and this is my, just my own personal opinion, but I think it has faded away over the years because we are just, we're bombarded with images now. I mean. You know, we, we have so many images on our phone, on, on everywhere, that, um, that the, to see drawings in an illustrated novel kind of take away from it. 
you know, again, that, that idea of turning the page and seeing the couple at, at Paris and the Eiffel Tower in the background, you know, you had a picture of it in your mind that if the, if the prose was good enough, it brought to life. But you brought a lot to it as well, whether you had been there yourself or you'd always dreamed of. And even if it was a film you'd seen or something, you did have a picture. And if you saw somebody else's picture, well, it limited your imagination. And so I didn't want to address that really at all. So, you know, Emmett is never like, like, here is the picture of exactly what I'm looking at, unless he's telling you he's sitting there drawing. But it's not, this is what's happening in a scene. He's, you're really sort of paying attention to his experience as a creative person. Mm -hmm. So they become two parallel narratives and it becomes the story of the drawings. And I think that that's what I did uh, even more robustly in this, in this book is, again, the, the volumes. You know, we see him making pen and ink drawings and we see them breaking down to sketches. We see him making drawings of Diane's work, and then we see him coming back to his studio and making big, robust drawings later on. And that all ties in, runs along with the other narratives that are going, the, the mystery narrative. So my hope is that it's really just addressing it in a completely different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you say, uh, or I should say, um, Emmett says uh, that um, uh, a few times in, in, in book one, at least, that, um, you know, he's, he's kind of been stuck in his life um, uh, since Julia's uh, disappearance and, and um, not moving on. And he uses um, the art to kind of push his life forward, his own narrative. You know, he's, that's for him. The show um, is, is a kind of way to try to relaunch what he's doing. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if, if this evolution of, of form um, if, if you found that to be the case uh, for you as well, um, uh, what's, what's the next direction? Um, uh, are you, are you, um, you just, so you're working on the Emmett Hopper series, yeah. And yeah, I, you know, we were talking about character earlier and the more I got to know him, the more I wanted to write about him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even as I was finishing up the first book, I didn't know that I would do anymore. I hadn't had any intentions, but it was actually during one of the final drafts. I, and I write about this in the afterword of Come to Light. The final drafts of Close Enough for the Angels, I had this flash of Emmett years later. And it's one of the scenes in the book. And it was what set off the whole second volume is that one image I had. And I realized, oh, he has a light. Like, I kind of know what happens to him afterwards. And, uh, and that made me end the book differently. I changed the ending completely because... I thought, oh, this is part of something bigger now. And that got me really excited. This idea that I was writing, I was world building. And that, um, and that I, was, I could put all these little pieces out that would form, form a life, really, you know? But you asked about, you know, is, is it the same way for me of, you know? Uh, and I think that any creative person, it is a little bit like I, I use my work to propel me into the future to give me, I mean, as trite as it sounds, but like to give me, uh, hope, I, because if, you know, hope is essentially you can imagine tomorrow and tomorrow's good, <laughs> you know, right? Like, like, and, um, and so, you know, when, especially making long, writing long form, one assumes they're going to finish it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's, what's funny. It's like, you, you know, Mirakami said something great. Uh, he's like, whenever I start a new book, start writing a new book, I just hope I get to the end to it. I'm alive to get to the end of it. And, um, and that's the, there is some of that just like, yeah, well, yeah, I'll be, I'll be alive and kicking and everything will be good in three years and we'll finish this and put that out. And so there is this you sort of use it as your own like carrot at the end of the stick to chase after. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say that I use it in the same way that I gave it to Emin. Mm -hmm. I give it to him. as like, it's really all he has left. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he's sort of burned out, but he's used, he's scratching in the dirt hoping to, you know, kick up some, some sparks to the land, catch fire, and then turn into, into something greater. For sure. Um, is it in that way, kind of like um, the way that you worked on, um, like, the Oliver Coffee and, and Small Potatoes, even um, uh, um, a cereal just without the deadline? Um, do, you, do you think of it in a parallel way? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, hmm. I don't know that I do. Because one of the things I started doing with All Over Coffee was uh, why well, I, I, I would work in batches. And I got really good at this after a few years because I think there's, there's nothing more crazy making than make a piece, turn it in for deadline, and then start over. I mean, it's a little like, that would be like COVID. It's just like, 
Yep, same today as it was yesterday. And uh, talk about falling into creative repetition. So I would work on like anywhere from four to 12 pieces at a time. And I would finish bodies of, of all of our coffee pieces. And, uh, and that's something that would be really cool. It's, it's, I think that comes from being a painter, you know, and you work on themes and you make a whole body of paintings and then you have an exhibition. Mm -hmm. You sort of have a clearing and, uh, and then you start another body and you might be responding off of that. So I did a lot of that with Oliver Coffee because I might finish those 10 pieces, turn them in. So now I had two and a half months before I had to worry about another weekly deadline. So it was a way of sort of fooling myself. And then I could, and then some of those pieces I could work on for that entire 10 weeks. You know, I could make a big drawing that took me 10 weeks to make and then some that took me two days to make. And then when I turned in the next batch, there was sort of this like, wow, how did you do one of those in a week? Well, I didn't because I figured out a different process. So maybe in that way it is similar because setting out on the novel, it's the same way. You know, you're writing, you're writing and drawing. It just, uh, it just don't have those milestones, which are, are more challenging. And so travel helps me with that a lot. Like, oh, well, I'm leaving. If I'm leaving town, then I have to have X done. Or I'm in this place for two months. I have to come out of here with this chapter written and these drawings made. Mm -hmm. Would you, um, that makes me think of, of Emmett um, with his three phones and, and, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, who, who, who should he book the flight, you know, for um, being right, a, he's a, under aliases. Exactly, exactly. What, what was that like for you? Um, uh, his, I imagine that's not the kind of juggling that you typically have to do, but maybe, maybe I don't know you as well. As I. <laughs> no, you know this person. No, no, I, I, I have, I have, as far as I know, I haven't gone in, under any aliases. Um, no, it was fun. Again, creating a character and, and he, he did it because he's in that situation. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the cool thing because what are the choices that somebody needs to make? And what, you know, if, if I make myself laugh or, or if I find it clever, I have to find it enjoyable. Like just solving the, the creative problem isn't enough. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like I have to project and say, well, what if I read this? Would I think that that was an interesting turn or you know, what, what excites me, what gets me to turn the page. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because I do drawings and there's so many elements to putting a book like this together. We don't talk as much about plot, which, which is fine. But, um, you know, it, I, I do want to say that it's so important to me that it be an engaging story and that it, that it keeps people reading because it doesn't matter how many beautiful drawings are in there. If the story isn't good, no one's going to finish it, you know, and, and uh, I want them to get to the end and I want them to be satisfied and be surprised. And, and, uh, and so that's why, I mean, you know, you have a lot of readers along the way, you have editors, you have people who, who, who will be frank and be like, mm, that was kind of cheesy. <laughs> you, know, you might want to figure, solve that. Or, mm -hmm. and, and then one last thing I want to say about like place too, like I had, I had Emmett going to places. I have drawings from places that I ended up cutting out completely because I realized that wasn't part of the, the important in the narrative. He didn't, it, it was, it was like, okay, well, yeah, sure. I'd love to show those drawings, but the story didn't need it. And so at the end of the day, you've got to have that really critical editor's eye and say, well, what is that through line? There's a story I'm telling here and everything else is in service of that story. And so that's why, you know, there are dozens more sketches yeah. and, and other finished drawings that just didn't go in. And, uh, and I like that. I like that there's beautiful stuff on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask if there's a, um, you know, a, um, uh, a, a journal of, of unpublished Emmett Hopper uh, <laughs> drawings or something that, that might be found out in the world in, in some other capacity. Well, you know, that actually gives, gives me opportunity down the line mm -hmm. to say, like, be able to use that stuff in a different way and maybe use that as a launch to tell another story. Mm -hmm. And so that's where they can feed off of each other, right? Uh, like I said, you know, showing the, the Gaudi drawing hadn't initially been made for, for, for Emmett, but I, uh, I liked it. I was like, okay, well, that's a reason to tie in Barcelona because he needed to go somewhere, right? For, uh, the, and if I was going to choose a place and I had something to, as a, as already as an entrance for me, so I could feed off of the, the story and then also feed off the drawings. Awesome. Uh, I want to just uh, pause and say, um, encourage um, you guys uh, who are tuned in, if you have any questions for Paul, um, feel free to ask um, anytime. Uh, I, know, I know he'll have a good answer for you. <laughs> or at least a long babbling one <laughs> i haven't even looked at the messages there there are people drinking and and i and drinking whiskey while during this is quite appropriate because uh emmett drinks a great deal of whiskey throughout this book 
And and um and and I take it I take it that you're a, you're a whiskey guy. And... These days I am, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and it's funny because I'm not much of a Scotch person. I've begun to enjoy it a bit, I will admit. Uh, but I really give him this like just that he hates Scotch and that he just rails on it. And that's one of the fun things too is you know you get to be give a character this sort of like exaggerated uh, points of view or something. And, and not, it's, it's, you know, it's not a political point of view. It's nothing, it's nothing polarizing. Uh, it's, it's just something that makes, you know, makes him who he is. Yeah. I enjoy, I enjoy Emmett um, uh, really talking, talking shit about scotch. It's, uh, <laughs> Are you in that camp as well? What's that? Are you in that camp as well? No, it's it's funny. I, I actually like Scotch a lot, um, which which for some reason that just tickles me that this character just can't stand it. Um, but I but I also uh, share share his love for um, for instance when Basil Hayden's gets mentioned, I, I got very excited. Um, <laughs> that was my whiskey uh, of choice for a while, so or my my bourbon of choice, I should say. Um, Sometimes I think of uh, is like bourbon and rye as being sort of like the the kids version of Scotch. You know, like the adults drink Scotch, right? So. And Emmett's kind of a big kid in a lot of ways, right? He, he, he has a real life, but he kind of, you know, he's, he's got this crazy artist life. And so, which, which sort of exists in this different realm. And, and uh, you know, I want to say too, that was, that was something that I noticed in crime fiction because I read a lot of it and I try to read crime fiction from around the world and, and all eras. And there's never been an artist protagonist. You know, we've had all different sorts of amateur sleuths uh, and and lots of the like accidental detectives, which is what Emmett is, right? He's not a he's not setting out uh, to to be uh, to to solve crimes. He just has these things that embroil him. And uh, and I thought it's really fun if I can create within the pantheon of amateur detectives an artist. That's really fun. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, so it looks like we have um, a, a question here from Eric. Um, Eric's asking, you mentioned Myra Coleman as an illustrated novel influence. Who are some of your prose influences and how do you think influences appear uh, in this book? Yeah, that's interesting. I think that uh, prose wise, it's, it's more about form, about how they write. Uh, it's, it's, you know, Raymond Chandler. I mean, if, if anybody it's you know, a big noir fan, they tend to be a Raymond Chandler fan. Uh, what I love about Chandler is like in every one of his books, he has a scene that is just so moody and so evocative. Uh, and, and, but he was also very, you know, he terse in his writing style. You know, that's where sort of in that era of hard boiled, right? That, that's clipped. Uh, but I mean, it was also the, the personality, but it was the writing style. I'm, I mean, Hemingway huge for, for like that, that short writing style and, you know, keep your, uh, keep your sentences clean and, to the point and think about the spaces in between. Um, who was it? Uh, I, I hate when I like, I have somebody in mind and I actually can't think. Who wrote Black Dahlia? Can you, do you know off the top of your head? I don't. I, don't. Uh, I mean, he's, he, he's written so many wonderful books, but um, James Elroy, thank you. Eric, thank you, <laughs> I just saw in the chat. So James Elroy was actually a huge influence in terms of my writing style because uh, I, I read, he was talking about one of his books that it went something like 10,000 words over 20,000 words, something like a lot over what the publisher wanted. And so they wanted to cut a whole section of the book, but instead what he went in and he went, he went into every sentence and he just deleted words that he said, well, these words don't need to be here. Like prepositions or something. So sometimes his sentences are, they're grammatically correct, but they're just kind of chunked together and it creates this form sort of like, you know, uh, it's like Hemingway's been up all night for like 12 days, you know, like a little bit. And, and, uh, and then he got those 10,000 words out, but still got to tell his story. And when you start to feel that clipped uh, rhythm and you get into it, you don't miss the, the, the missing words. And um, I don't know that I, I achieved that level because I don't want his voice. I wanted my voice. And, and my voice is very colloquial, you know, because it's, I'm, you know, this book is at first person, present tense, you know, it's, so I wanted, I needed to find El, uh, Emmett's voice as along with being mine. Uh, but those were the people I think that had the most influence on, on this novel specifically. Awesome. Um, thanks for that question, Eric. Um, we've got a question from Charles. Uh, what details do you look for in developing a sense of place in your images? 
Are those details the same for how you approach establishing setting in prose? Hmm. Uh, interestingly, I think the, the details for the drawings, I didn't try to change my perspective. I talked about like when I finishing all over coffee and realizing, oh, I've essentially done that drawing before. Uh, I allowed myself to stand in the same places, let's say, for doing the finished drawings for this book, because I felt like I was tearing down so many other things. You know, I was tearing down the drawing style and, you know, working in many different materials. And, you know, Diane's maybe was the most where I, I had put myself in a different point of view. But in terms of uh, the approach for establishing setting in prose, my, the, I always establish setting by, uh, by where is the character and how's the character entering that scene. And I, I really dislike, I don't describe a scene very much. Anytime I'm going to do that, I'll say, well, I'm going to do that in a drawing. Uh, I want that mood. Let the drawing give that mood because I don't want to describe the light. And if I do, it's somehow relating to the drawing. I try to, really, I, I give as few details as possible because I want the, the reader to fill them in. But I need to give you some sense of place. And, and again, I think giving you a few drawings is a lot to fill in all those gaps. But I do think of my, my stories as being similar to the drawings. Like the, the, they, overall, they feel the same to me. I don't know if that's true for the reader as well, though. Um, so we have a, a question from Linda. Um, you said you read a lot of, you read a lot of detective novels. Are there any specific ones that helped inspire Emmett? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, in, in terms of his character, not necessarily, but there is a, there's a uh, author that he's reading, uh, Van de Wettering, which is the Dutch author I talked about from the 1970s, who writes these really interesting crime books uh, that and it's, I think there are 14 of them. And about halfway through the series, they start to get really punchy, like almost comical. And his character names start to, they're really funny. And there's all these, these like hilarious scenes. But what's great is like, nobody ever gets mad. Nobody ever like goes on these tirades. Even the criminals, while wow, they're they, like, they get caught and they're like, oh, I'm caught. Um, and then the cops are leading them away. And they're like, why did you do that stupid thing? And I'm sort of, I'm, you know, I'm, oversimplifying it, but they're really enjoyable to read and they have a sense of reality to them too, because he's really writing about uh, Amsterdam in the seventies. And there's a lot of like cultural references that, that, uh, that, that put you in, in the book. And so he, I, I gave him to Emmett. Emmett is reading him the entire time. And, uh, and so that was a huge influence. And so I made sure to read all the Van Wettering novels while I was writing this. That's awesome. Yeah, I love how Emmett um, is is carrying those books around or, or shipping them to other locations um, uh, for when he, when he when he returns. Yeah, uh, a little little sub subplot. Um, yeah. Um, any any other questions? Um, drop them in the chat, um, you guys. Yeah, we just have a few minutes left. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a question. This is kind of um, well, maybe first a placement question. I'm wondering. I know so close enough for the angels is it, that's the first book in the Emmett series. Yeah. And then this is the the second. Yeah. And then um, how many books is it? Do you, do you know that or is it oh, in is the it, series? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I I don't I don't know. Yeah. And and I don't mind not knowing. Sure. Uh, and you know, interestingly, like he references close enough for the angels. Mm -hmm. because and I, I don't really want to give away why but there's something very meta that happens with him talking about having written that book and mm -hmm. the things that happened in it and so people are, keep asking me like oh I haven't read the first one should I read the first one and I think it really doesn't matter mm -hmm. like you don't you really don't have to know anything about that book to read this one uh, and I, I I'm interested to talk to people like if if you read the second one first and then you go back and read the first one it's mm -hmm. going to have a different understanding and then vice versa and both are I think really they inform each other so that's because that's what we do as readers too oftentimes when I find authors if they've, they've got like six books already or something I'm like how have I never heard of these people and that's great because now I have six and maybe I dove in at their latest one and then I start in the beginning mm -hmm. and what's wonderful is if you go back to the beginning you see the the seeds that they didn't yet know about their characters and or even their writing style that then bloom and, and turn in and then and then you after a while you'll start to see them planting stuff because they know oh i'm gonna write another book <laughs> uh, and, and so then they they plant a little so things for themselves to two books down the line they can pick up mm -hmm. and so i was able to do some of that 
in this book as well. Like there was some backstory stuff that, uh, that I put in here that, that helped his character. And, and I'm like, well, that's great. That's an entire book if I want to write that. Mm-hmm. And, and so I would come up with all the, these ideas. And so it's like, great. If, at any point I can just decide which, what is the next one I want to tell, or if it's never told, then so be it. Very cool. Um, I'm also wondering, um, uh, just out of curiosity, um, as you're working on this illustrated novel, um, I imagine you're doing other, other visual art, other visual works. Um, uh, what, what's that like? Um, do you, do you, do you find that your different projects, um, inform one another? Um, is it just like a totally different mind space that you enter or how, how does that work? Yeah, it's a different mind space. And, and I, I like that because, uh, we all need breaks. And, and uh, breaks are sort of things that help me. If I have a problem to solve, uh, the best thing to do is to take a break. I mean, it, it, it took me a lot of years to learn that and maybe it will change again. But I can tell you when I was writing Close Enough for the Angels, if I hit a plot problem, I would just sit down and try to write my way through it. And I, you know, there were times I would throw out weeks of writing, but it was because I felt like, oh, if I don't work, then, oh my God, I'm never, it's, it's gonna fall apart. Whereas I would hit a, a plot problem with this book and be like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, work on this other project. And, you know, I did things like I did Anchor Steam's uh, beer label last year. You know, that was a really fun project and took a lot of work uh, to scout and get. And, and I mean, I did a handful of like mural projects and, and lots of commissions. So things that, you know, would put me in a different state of mind and also would be one offs. Be like, OK, I have a problem to solve here for this project. I need to do this 40 foot mural. Uh, and and so it would be great because if I felt like I needed a break, I would just step away from it, go work on something else, and then it might come to me, and I'd make a few notes or keep it in my head, and then when it was time to go back and and work on that book, I could. Now I also want to say that the shifts between drawing and writing provide those same being able to walk away, because mm-hmm. I wouldn't draw and write in the same day a lot of times. Uh, I might take two weeks and I'm just writing, and I'm like, okay, I got my way through that put it aside and I'll go work on that body of drawings, take a couple of weeks. And so that automatically gave these mental shifts as well. Very cool. Um, we've got um, another question here um, from, from Vene. Um, would you consider virtual teaching, um, illustration, writing, storytelling? And also, do you ever draw digitally? Uh, I'll answer the last one first. I have not drawn digitally, but um, it's interesting, this book really, did open me up and sort of broke a lot of my habits that I wanted to be breaking, broken. Like I intentionally wanted to break them. And, you know, before I would have been like, no, there's no need to do that. But now, you know, it really, I, I'd be great because I'm like, why not? Why not just do a whole body of drawings digitally to see what comes out? And they don't have to be for a specific project. And, and that's important too, I think, when you're stripping things down, is it can't be like, well, I've got to put this here and it's got to be for this reason. No, so you just have to make work for the sake of making work. And then you might, it'll influence no matter what, right? Like working is always good. Uh, in terms of teaching, I have taught, uh, I, have, I haven't done any virtual teaching. So I'm not, I'm not sure how that would go. I mean, sure, I mean, I'm open to things. Why not? <laughs> if someone's going to offer me a job teaching, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, yeah, I w- yeah, I was kind of wondering if you were doing um, uh, like class visits or anything like that. Now I know um, uh, digital learning has been obviously uh, a virtual learning has been um, uh, this sudden um, uh, thing that we've all needed to uh, uh, to embrace. I think, or a lot of people have needed to embrace and. I think some teachers are trying to get, um, you know, creative in, in, in how they uh, are having to get creative in how they how they um, teach their coursework. So, um, yeah, I imagine that would be a, that would be a boon to to, uh, to to some to some classes. Yeah, I, I do think it would be challenging. Uh, I don't have a ton of teaching experience, so I, I don't know that I could pivot as easily as some um, you know professional teachers. I think when I think about materials. You know, and just, uh, you know, and, and the, the act of being in a room with a group of people who are making drawings uh, and, and able to hold them up and show each other and just that tactile, you know, to be able to talk about how the brush feels on the paper or how much, you know, how much water or how wet the medium is or just all those different mm-hmm. elements. Uh, you, know, you know, when I taught, I would bring in a stack of different papers and just be like, you know, let's, let's look at these, feel these. And imagine, and you know, make some marks on these things. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
I'm sure it's it's doable. It's just a, I, th I think that would be a challenge for something yeah, so tactile. For sure. Um, so we have another couple questions. Um, uh, one is, do you have any advice for a later in life illustrator? Mm. Well, I think you know later in life can have two two elements. On, on one, you can be really set free from all the expectations of when you're young and, and like, oh, I need to make a living at this or I need to do all these things. But it can also, I think, if you are trying to do it professionally, it can, one of the challenges can be the, the knowledge of how much exists out in the world and how hard it is to get noticed. I think in a way my, my ignorance and my naivete of being young helped me because if I, if I understood and I'm sure I don't understand it all even now, right? But if I understood even what I know now about how hard it is to make it in the marketplace and to get seen, it might have been overwhelmingly crushing. So the ignorance of that and the sort of uh, <laughs> cockiness that comes with youth of being like, of course I can make this work. <laughs> that, you know, that served me then. And, um, but I think on the other hand, some people, like you can be in a place where you're like, no, I've, you know, I've done things in my life that I want to do, and now I just want to learn this. You can be set free of all of it and do it for the sake of doing it and, um, and find the joy in making mistakes. I mean, it's all about making mistakes. I mean, you, you make a thousand mistakes before you make one thing. You're like, that's wonderful. And then you screw it up. And you're like, well, that was wonderful. And so you start <laughs> over again. Um, and, and in a way, that's, there's, there is something holding you back when you get good at something like, or get known for it, like getting known for the pen and ink style or getting known for the way of writing in all over coffee. You know, you try to change that and you've got to confront uh, people's expectations of you and then also your expectations of what the world is giving to you. You get used to being fed from, from oh, I like this and, or I'm selling this number of pieces or this number of books or whatever. And then you make something new and people are like, oh, I like the other stuff. Or then you've got new people who are like, oh, that's amazing. You have to be willing to be like, well, it, it changes. So you just got to let it, let it go. And, and that's an emotional uh, experience you have to be having uh, that's aside from the creative experience and setting those two apart can be a challenge. So, you know, like coming into the studio and there are days when I have to get things done, that's one, one type of work. Then there are the days I come in, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do today. And that's leaving the world outside and just coming in here to work. Mm -hmm. um, and then somebody asked about Mad Magazine, right? Yeah, what if anything stays with you to this day about your uh, experience at Mad Magazine? It was, it was uh, integral into forming what I'm doing today because first thing, I walk into MAD and I expected to meet all the, those artists that, that I you know, grew up reading and loved. There wasn't an artist in sight. Uh, and the, they were like, this is an editorial magazine. This is just, you know, we're, here's the editorial staff. And I, I came to meet the artists who would come in and, and we'd go to parties or whatever, but they really got me to understand how the the magazine worked and how telling stories with drawings it's it's the writing and that's what the editors they were like everything begins with the writing you have to know your story first and um and it was so obvious once they told me and that's when i began you know i did i would do layouts like i did layouts for more trucker for his movie parodies and i would get the script from the writer and my job was to lay out the text bubbles, which Mort then had to draw around. And it was so the opposite of how I thought. And from then on, I was like, well, story comes first. Everything I do. So even all over coffee, 95% of the time, it was written before I would do a drawing. And you know, I don't know if that's apparent to the reader or not, especially because the, the drawing featured so prominently in all over coffee. But that Mad Magazine gave me that perspective. And I think in, in a way that's why I'm, it's turned into novels because I'm still, I'm still thinking about story. And why am I doing these drawings? Oh, what's the story of the drawings? And then it turns into that, how do I work? So, but you know, it's like a hierarchy of thought. Thanks Mad Magazine. <laughs> thanks Mad Magazine. <laughs> who, who can actually say thanks Mad Magazine, you made my life better? <laughs> Oh, I think there's plenty of people out there who could say that. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, thank you, Paul. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Nice to see you.
Yeah, always good to talk to you. And um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, uh, if you don't have the book, um, you should buy it and you should get it from Booksmith. Here's the <laughs> link. Um, we have signed copies and Paul will be happy to uh, personalize them for you. Um, just make a note when you're checking out. Um, and um, yeah, um, hope to see you in, in real life uh, uh, sometime. But um, absolutely. until then, um, yeah, take care and, and stay well. Um, thank and you. congratulations again. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night.